Hello. Uh, it's hello. 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 Hello there. <laughs> Welcome back to the Space Gulag. Today we're gonna find out what would have happened had Yoda been the Sith Lord. Our story begins in 666 BBY. A young student of the dark side bounced around. She was a young, vibrant Sith apprentice. Her master instructed her to work on her training while he had to attend to some business. She was known as Darth Athema. Her master was the Dark Lord of the Sith, Darth Strud. He had been a Sith for nearly 82 years. His master found him when he was just a boy. Darth Strud was from Dantween, and he was leaving his apprentice for the time being so that he could work on something else. Darth Athema was in her early 20s. She was young, vibrant, and energetic. She was still learning from her master, and even she knew that Darth Strud didn't have a long time left. She continued her training, but Athema felt a disconnect. There was something that felt superficial about her master. She believed that maybe he had other motives. Athema moved around as she flung her lightsaber around her, and then she sheathed it. She tiptoed to an adjacent room as she listened to her master begin talking to someone else. A voice spoke back to him as Athema listened through the door. The voice said the name Master to Strud. Athema's rage boiled. She couldn't believe that her master would just betray her like this. She made her way back to the training room though, quietly, so that when her master came out, she could surprise attack him. Athema went back to her exercise as she ignited her lightsaber and swung at the training droids surrounding her. She was quick on her feet and she didn't stop when her master eventually walked in. She again sheathed her blade and bowed to her master. He looked at her. She lifted her head as he drew his lightsaber and swung at her violently. Athema pulled herself back as she bent over backwards, kicking her leg into the air, almost hitting her master in the jaw. The older man lunged forward as Athema blocked the strike from Master Strud. The sounds of lightsabers echoing drew the attention of a younger individual from the other room. Athema and Strud collided. They got close as Athema punched her master in the throat. He grabbed at his neck with his hand as he stumbled backwards until his other hand was left to defend himself. Athema pushed her assault. While she was young, she used Form 4 and she was studying to use Form 7. Master Strud stepped forward while he tried to keep a hold of his breath. Athema was disappointed. She never wanted it to come to this, but it was the way of the Sith. Eventually, she would have to kill the old master, though a small part of her hoped that she would never have to kill the man that essentially raised her. Athema swung forward, and it was too much for Master Strud, as his blade toppled out of his hand and he watched as Athema swung, cutting his limbs off of his body before jabbing her blade into his stomach. Strud fell to the ground with his eyes left open. Athema looked down at him with disappointment, and then from the corner of the room, she saw a lightsaber illuminate. A little voice called out, accusing her of killing his master. Athema jumped back as she pulled her master's blade into her hand. A little creature lunged at her from across the room as she stood her ground and used a force to throw the creature into the wall adjacent to her. Athema demanded to know who it was and who it was that her master was training. The little creature leapt across the floor as he held his lightsaber out. He said his name was Yoda. Athema held her blades out as she lifted him up into the air and ripped him down to the ground in front of her, smashing him into the floor. Yoda's blade flew from his hands. Athema sheathed her master's blade as she dragged Yoda with the force into her hands. She wrapped her hand around Yoda's throat as she dug her nails into the side of his neck. Athema told Yoda, while slamming him to a wall, to give her one reason to not gut him right here and right now. Yoda struggled to breathe as he looked at Athema with fear. He then quickly thought as he suggested to her that he could study under her. Athema's grip loosened. She looked at Yoda and then asked the question, demanding to know how long her master had been training him. Yoda squeaked out an answer that informed her that he wasn't just trained by one Sith. Athema let go as she let Yoda drop to the floor. Athema held her blade down at Yoda and asked that he explain himself. Yoda coughed as he regained control of his own breathing. He told her that he was found by a Sith Lord when he was a child. The Sith Lord watched over him until another Sith took the mantle. The Sith took care of his training for the rest of her life, and then, from there, Master Strud took the mantle as Yoda's teacher. Currently, Yoda was 230 years old. He had had three teachers, and now he was offering up Athema the chance to be his fourth. Yoda was still learning, there was no inclination for him not to, to continue his learning. His species were known for living up to a thousand years old easily, and he would certainly need another teacher. Though the problem is, Yoda had more training than Athema. 
On the other hand, Athema had more power than Yoda. She was impressive. She was an impressive student of the Force, and she had the potential to become a great Sith. Her power made her someone that Yoda knew would be a good master. Yoda really was more afraid of her than not, and while he was in his 200s, she and him were close to the same age in terms of their species. Though Athema was slightly older, and she had to figure out how to become a master of a 200 year old Sith apprentice. Athema had some ideas. Currently, the Sith were hidden from the galaxy. They hadn't been seen or heard from in hundreds of years. The Sith were plotting their return to power, and yet Master Strud never told Athema of what his plans were. He kept her out of the loop a lot. Dar Strud truly intended on passing Yoda on to Athema, but he felt threatened by her and assumed that she was going to kill him, which is why he drew his weapon. It was an obvious misstep because it only caused him an early death. Athema looked at Yoda. She told him that she would be in her quarters for the time being, and that she accepted his offer, requesting that he remove the body of Darth Strud from the training quarters. Yoda nodded his head as Athema walked out of the room. She walked into her quarters and dropped Darth Strud's lightsaber to the ground as she sat down on her bed and leaned her head up against the wall. Athema questioned her abilities to teach someone who was two centuries older than her. Yoda had been trained by three Sith Lords, and yet his negotiation was to be trained by Athema. Darth Athema had a question that needed to be answered for herself. It was if she could actually provide a strong enough resolve to make Yoda believe she could be his master. The only thing for Yoda was that he had a warped understanding of the Sith. While the traditional rule of two suggested that a Sith apprentice rise up and kill his or her master, Yoda was too vulnerable to do as such, so when he was passed down from master to master, he just assumed it was one master dying of old age and another one taking up the mantle of Sith Lord. It wasn't until Athema that he saw the true meaning of the rule of two, yet Yoda at this point didn't possess the poise or confidence to believe he could stand up to Athema, and while it was entirely possible that he could stand up to her, Athema was much more confident in herself as a duelist and as a force wielder than Yoda was. Athema looked up. She saw her reflection staring at her. She twisted her master's blade around in her hand. She would adopt the role of Sith Lord. And yes, while she was still very young, she knew just the right amount of information in which she could adequately train Yoda and make him believe that she was training him. The only benefit she could think of is that Yoda most likely wouldn't betray her, because he hadn't betrayed Strud or the other two Sith Lords. But Athena thought as she aged, Yoda would be close to 300 years old when she was in her 80s or 90s. Yoda would still be in his prime, which he could use that to his advantage to either kill her or let her die. Athema had an idea. She rose to her feet and walked to her master's quarters and then ripped the room apart looking for anything that would be a guide for her. Something that could possibly give her an idea of what to do. Something that could enhance her knowledge in the dark side of the Force. Athema, while still young, had no doubts about who she was and what she represented. There was no secondary thoughts about balancing out like a Knight Sister, and no, certainly not any thoughts of becoming a Jedi, or joining the light side of the Force. She was fully committed to the dark side, and her loyalties were proven to work out for her as she thrived off the darkness much more so than Strud or even his master did. There was a reason why Yoda respected her. It was because her ceiling was much higher than anyone else he'd interacted with. Yoda believed she could only be an effective ally, and while Yoda himself wasn't aware of his own motivations or how he would handle having Athema as a master, he did know that she wasn't someone he wanted to challenge. She was someone he wanted to learn from, and even more develop a strong friendship and relationship with. Athema pulled out a small crystal-like object. She'd never seen it before, but it was a Sith holocron. Her master never taught her the power of the ancients. Dar Strud, in a way, feared what his apprentice would become, and so he limited her. Athema, on the other hand, didn't have an ego. She was focused on the greater good of the Sith. She didn't really care about the petty rivalry that would develop naturally between a master and apprentice, and she, in her own way, never intended on killing Darth Strud. She intended on working with him for the rest of his life. That wasn't the case, and so she took the crystal and used the force on it. It was a learning experience, but when it opened, she accessed so much raw potential. She closed her eyes, and she was filled with the information she never knew she could possess. The holocron told her of what the Sith homeworld, planets, things that she never heard of. There were things that she discovered as well, some of them being lightsaber techniques, force abilities, and a wide array of everything in between. Athema opened her eyes and before her showed a hollowed up map of the galaxy. 
Only planets on the galaxy were named with precise coordinates and hyperspace lanes on how to arrive. Some of the planets that were on there were by the names of Kreis II, Korriban, Malachor, and Exegol. These were all planets of the Sith homeworlds. Places full of knowledge that could give Athema and her new apprentice a means to grow their power. Athema closed a hologram and looked around at the mess she made. She continued searching throughout Darth Strud's stuff and didn't find anything of interest to her, except a small necklace that he normally kept on his person. On the necklace was a small figure. It was very odd looking, but she placed it on her belt as she wrapped her robes around her. Athema walked out of the room as she called Yoda's name and started walking towards Strud's shuttle. Their lair was hidden on a backwater world. It wasn't really much of a lair either. Strud didn't have a concept of the Force, and so he didn't have a Sith altar. The biggest failure of the Sith was their inability to rise above their own failures. The Sith for thousands of years were fragile. They had no real power. The last time they had any power was with Malgus. Darth Bane's decision to cut down the size of the Sith Order made their chances of finding a gem within Force users much less likely, allowing the Jedi to capitalize in the lack of Sith. All the best Force users in existence lived within their own societies, whether it be the Jedi, the Barando Sages, the Atta Run, the Bazik Priestesses, or the Night Sisters. Athema walked forward with a strut in her step. She showed nothing but power within her step. She stomped and turned to look at Yoda, who walked out of the adjacent room. He bowed to her and asked what she would like. Athema gestured forward to him to follow. Part of Athema believed that she would have to be tougher than she normally was. Athema was already tough, as it was, but it was more so keeping up the imagery of a powerful Sith Lord, considering that's what she was now, probably the most powerful Sith Lord since Malgus or even before him. Athema and Yoda walked out to a small shuttle parked outside of the building in the middle of the barren weight field that they were positioned at. Athema stepped into the ship and stepped hastily onto the bridge as she opened up the computer console and placed different pieces of the ship's navigation system on and around the Sith holocron. Athema told Yoda that they were going to reinstate the Sith legacy. Strada and the Sith before them were failures. She told Yoda that they would break the rule of two. Yoda almost immediately questioned why she thought this was a good idea, but she then reaffirmed her thought process. She told Yoda that they wouldn't create an army of Sith like the ancient days, and said they would push for something much more stricter and smaller. Athema pulled the ship into the air and pulled out of the atmosphere as she looked down at the holocron and locked in the coordinates for the closest Sith star system. When the ship jumped into hyperspace, Athema spun her seats towards Yoda and asked what he was taught by Master Strud. Yoda quickly responded as he told her everything that Strud taught him. Either Darth Strud was too stupid to learn anything from his master, or he was too afraid to teach Athema more information because he feared her. Yoda admitted it seemed like Strud taught him everything he knew. Athema leaned back in her seat as she registered that Darth Strud was a failure of a Sith, something that really disappointed her because she looked up to him. Of course she did. He was essentially her father. For the rest of the trip through hyperspace, the bridge would be silent. There was not anything said between Yoda or Athema. Hours later, they would arrive over a dark planet. Their first destination was Kreis II. It wasn't one of the widely known homeworlds of the Sith, but it would be a good place for the two of them to start their training. Athema glided the ship down through the atmosphere and landed under the shadow of a Sith temple that rested gently above the fog that covered the entire planet. When the ship landed, Athema turned everything off and stood up. She unplugged the Sith holocron and walked out of the ship with it inside of her black robes. Yoda followed her quietly as they started walking towards the temple. Yoda didn't say anything, he was trying to get a feel for his master, and she wasn't easy to read. He couldn't tell she was acting tough, he just assumed that she was naturally tough as a woman. Athema stepped forward into the fog as Yoda kept his eyes locked on her shadow that dusted through the fogs of Kreis too. Darth Athema stood next to the temple as she traced her hand along the outside. She had no clue of how to open it. Darth Strud was overly conservative with his knowledge, something he carried on from masters that came before him. They never went outside their comfort zone, and so these Sith temples full of legendary power were never accessed. Athema and Yoda were the first Sith in three centuries to visit Kreis II, let alone any of the other Sith temples galaxy-wide. Athema thought for a moment. She raised her hands and cleared the fog from around the Sith temple, and then she could get a better look at what was around it. Yoda watched his master as she began to walk around the sides, looking for an entrance. Athema turned the corner and looked across. There was a hole that tumbled down into the temple. It was created to be what seemed to be an entrance. Lord Athema requested that Yoda 
follow her as she jumped down into the walkway and ignited her lightsaber. Yoda leapt down behind her and looked around as he asked if he may ignite his lightsaber as well. She nodded as she took the lead. Yoda wanted to make sure he didn't threaten or appear to threaten his master. He cared a lot about appearing to be a good apprentice. He had no intentions of messing this up. There was a little trust between the two of them, and he had to be the one to establish the rest of the trust, because at this point, Athema could very easily kill him and just find another apprentice. Athema knew Yoda was powerful, but even she had to admit the small ego boost that came from Yoda having to ask and fight for her trust, when at the moment they very easily could be on even grounds in a spar or in a fight. Regardless, as they walked into the temple, Athema found a lever close to her. It wasn't really a lever, it was more so an insert. She pointed her lightsaber at it and gently pushed the blade through the hole in the wall. She heard a clicking noise as the temple began to illuminate, creaking and croaking could be heard as the temple came to life. The interior of the temple lit with a crimson glow as the entire layout of the underground temple was made visible. The pyramid that sat atop of the complex was really hollow, and on the bottom was where everything really was. Maybe it was a simple metaphor for the Sith, or maybe just a stupid design. Regardless, Athema told Yoda to look around for anything that might be of assistance for their greater plans. Yoda looked up at Athema and asked her what these greater plans were. She stopped in her tracks, not even she'd gotten that far to come up with a plan. So, on the whim, she told him that it was obviously the destruction of the Jedi, takeover of the Republic, and, for the fun of it, the beginning of a 13-seat Sith Order. Yoda nodded his head as he walked down into the structure. Athema took a deep breath. She was slowly becoming more and more confident, but she had a long way to go until she was truly a Sith Lord. She herself walked down to the temple, examining artifacts big and small, and searching for more holocrons. There had to be more information they could use. The force was so incredible and the powers it could give were limitless, so Athema searched for anything that could enhance it. Athema walked up to a massive door, she examined it, and then looked down. It seemed as if a key of sorts was needed to get into it, and then she thought. She pulled out her master's necklace and placed it next to the hole. It seemed to be a perfect fit, and so she lined it up and pushed it in gently, and then the door began to creak open. She took the key and walked in. She couldn't believe it. The old fool wore a key to the Sith Temple since the death of his master and didn't even realize the potential that it had. She stood in the entrance and ignited her lightsaber to shine some light into the room. Walking forward, she looked at dust and cobwebs that covered the entire room. It was really peculiar as she found a switch to give the room more light, and then she sheathed her lightsaber. In front of her was an altar. She'd never seen a Sith altar before. Her master didn't have one. This would be the first step into a larger world for her. She stood over the altar and looked down in it. There was a bit of mist surrounding it. Next to the altar was an ancient book. It was left open, and it was read in the ancient language that she barely understood. Some of the words looked similar, similar to the words that she knew, but she would have to look and spend more time to examine this and understand it. Maybe she and Yoda could call Kreis to home for the time being, but Athema couldn't help but admit that she wanted to see more of the ancient Sith. She pondered as she leaned over the altar and thought of her decision. The bright side of staying on Kreis too would be gaining all the information the Sith Temple had to offer and the darkness of the planet. Then they could go to other planets and slowly build up their knowledge, but if they left Kreis too now, they would split their efforts and they would lose progress by focusing on too many different things rather than focusing on the resources they had here at Kreis too. The choice was tough, but in the end, it came to Lord Athema to decide to stay on Kreis too. She looked through the hidden room she was in and opened up more dusty books and stumbled upon a hologram of the final Sith to be inside of this room. The hologram popped up and it was Darth Bane. He stood silently as he looked at her and then spoke. The hologram was simply just a recording for anyone who found it, but Bay knew the Sith would likely lose touch with their temples and therefore their knowledge. On the chance that they returned the Kreis II with the necklace he created, meant to be passed down from generation to generation, then they would be able to find this room and use it to rekindle their knowledge of the Force. Darth Bane continued to explain his scheme, telling Athema that the master of the duo would learn from this room, to use this room for 249 days in a row, and then after that exact period of time, they would be able to teach their students everything the Sith had discovered up until this point with the Force. Bane may have split the Sith numbers down drastically, but his rule of two was meant to focus on longevity of the Sith. This room here on Kreis II would help perpetuate that plan into functioning properly. 
Lord Athema would spend the next three hours inside of his room before leaving and finding her apprentice inside of the training room. Yoda found some information, and then when his trail ran cold, he went to the training room, all in an attempt to oppress his master. When Darth Athema found him, she told him that they would be spending the next 250 days on Kreis II. He stopped what he was doing and asked if there was any reason to make her decide to change her plans. Yoda was clever, but he did feel like he was walking on eggshells, always looking for the nicest and most respectful way to ask his master questions. Yoda didn't want to come across like he was challenging her, and so he treaded extremely lightly. Athema didn't mind the question as she expressed that they would be able to develop all of what they needed here on Kreis II. The planet was covered in the dark side and it would prove to be a useful ally for them while they spent their time on the planet. Athema then asked Yoda what information he was able to come across. Yoda looked over to the side and pulled a holocron with a force into his hands as he handed it to his master. She asked what was on the holocron. Yoda admitted he didn't open it, because he didn't want to trespass on something she might want to do instead. Athema told Yoda that he had her permission to open up holocrons that he found within the temple, but just make sure that he shared all the information with her. Yoda nodded his head as she stepped back and told him to open up the holocron. Yoda placed the holocron on the ground and then lowered himself to the ground as he lifted the holocron into the air and pulled it apart with the force. It worked to perfection as it revealed information about a great battle. There was also another piece of information that was revealed. There was information about a secret order of Jedi that split off from the main Jedi Order that was currently on the planet Andrillion. Athema looked at all the information as she placed her hand on her chin, taking all the information in. Yoda then closed the holocron and reached out to hand her the holocron. Athema declined. She told her apprentice to hold on to it and make himself comfortable in what would be their new home for the time being. Yoda nodded as Athema told him to go back to training. She would be back soon. Yoda asked her where she was going. She turned and looked at him without saying a word. He retracted his question immediately as she turned around and continued out of the room. Athema was going to look into the local population around the temple. She found something inside of the documents inside of the secret room that there were several religions dedicated to the Sith. There was one here and there was also one on Exegol called the Sith Eternal. Though the one here was called the Sisters of Darkness, it was an entirely female population that were worshippers of the Sith. Some of the sisters were closer to witches, but most of them couldn't use force magic. They were very similar to the Night Sisters, but they weren't from Dathomir and they were just regular humanoids. Athema walked out of the temple and looked at the temple. It was glowing on the outside too. It meant that the Sith had fully returned the Kreis too. Athema looked outside as she climbed out of the entrance and saw 30 or so women shrouded in dark cloaks as they started speaking the same language that was in the book. Athema rose above them and then they all got on their knees to worship her. Athema welcomed us. This is what it meant to be a Sith. As she looked down at the witches and smiled, she was powerful and they respected and feared her power. Athema loved this and she continued forward as they jumped up and offered her a sacrifice in the form of a child. Athema looked at the child and pushed it away. The witches assumed this meant they would all be killed, and so they made preparation to make up for it. They ran down into their village in a great haste as they prepared a spell that the Sith Lord could use. Athema stepped down into the village, and then she waited. The Sith magic was certainly interesting as she watched the witches concoct their spells. Hours later, Athema would return to the temple after displaying the Sith had returned, enough to make sure the witches saw her as their new lord. The next 250 days would fly by for Yoda and Athema, and while Yoda grew in his power under the training of Darth Athema, she tripled in her own power under the teachings in the form of Darth Bane. Athema thrived in the dark side because she had a proper teacher. Darth Bane laid out teachings that were exactly the jumpstart the Sith needed to return from the depths of destruction. The Sith were so close to extinction, and if Strud didn't have an apprentice like Athema or even Yoda, there was a good chance the Sith Order would have died and their return would never, ever be seen. Athema grew in the Force, and while she did, her and her apprentice trained in epic sparring sessions. Yoda had yet defeated his master in one of these sparring sessions, but the benefit of the two of them being so young is that they were quickly rising into their own powers. They really benefited off of each other, though Yoda wasn't growing as fast as Athema. This was entirely because Athema was thriving off of Bane's teachings. She was using these to progress her own training. 
Nowadays, she wasn't in fear of being called out. Lord Athema had tons of confidence, and because of this confidence, she was even more powerful. Yoda truly respected her, in some ways he feared her. She was something more than any of the other three masters he ever had, combined, and she pushed him harder than anyone else ever had. Yoda did thrive off of this, but at the same time, he really enjoyed having Athema as a master. It wasn't a romantic attraction in the slightest, but he loved having her as his teacher. Their bond as master and student worked extremely well, and they were extremely fiery together. They often acted without having to tell each other what to do. Before Athema spoke, Yoda was already on top of the task that she wanted him to do, especially because they spent the majority of the last 250 days around each other. Yoda also greatly respected Athema and never questioned her, which made Athema trust her student a lot. She wasn't going to teach him everything just yet, but she fully intended on teaching him everything before she died, hopefully not by his blade. Athema's lessons with Bane went successfully. They built her up and gave her everything she needed to be a successful master. She learned the importance of the Force for a Sith Lord. She also learned incredible abilities that she didn't know Sith could possess. It wasn't an understatement to say that Master Strud almost destroyed the Sith. Lord Athema didn't realize she could use Force Lightning or Force Choke for starters. It was a wonder he knew anything. Lightsaber forms were common knowledge, but the information Lord Athema learned from Darth Strud regarding Form 4 and Form 7 lightsaber combat wasn't even a tenth of what either forms held. Everything was reduced to simplicity, maybe a reason why the Sith weren't able to strike against the Jedi in over 300 years. Though, during the last 250 days, she was able to grow exponentially in Forms 4 through 7. It was time that they leave Kreis too though. Their time here was great, especially for them to grow. The two Sith walked out of the temple. They had collected a couple of artifacts over the last several months, and the ship was packed up and ready to go. Athema and Yoda walked into the shuttle. The original holocron from 250 days before was already locked in and ready to go, so all they needed to do was lift off and head to the next closest planet. Athema was reminded of a small order on Andrillion, and so she and Yoda would take a detour from Kreis II to Korriban, and they would head to Andrillion first. Athema and Yoda were planning on executing an order of former Jedi. The Atarund weren't really even Jedi. They were just a peaceful group of priests, and didn't relate to the Jedi in any way. The Atarund protected and kept the peace, but they didn't have the wide reach of the Jedi. One of their members stumbled on the Kreis II within the last 48 to 68 hours, and left hastily when he discovered the Sith. This action would cost the small order of priests everything. When Yoda and Athema landed on Andrillion, they found the temple. They walked out of their vessel with poise. Lord Athema looked down at Yoda and told him to move forward and address the first members of the Atarund. The Council of the Atarund greeted the small Sith apprentice. Yoda didn't have time for this as he raised the first member of the Atarund into the air. Yoda didn't choke him, he just looked at him and the horror that came across his face and the others. They were really essentially Jedi, and as soon as they saw the Sith as a threat, they ignited their lightsabers. Yoda grinned as he threw the first member back and ignited his lightsaber. There were three members of the Atarund in front of him, and they all leapt into action. There was only one issue though, the members of the Atarun were very specifically focused on defense, and they only trained in the traditional Form 3 lightsaber combat. The Atarun didn't use any other lightsaber forms, and they struck especially to defense. Yoda leapt back and then forward as he swung at the knees of the Atarun. They cried out in fear as some of them weren't quick enough to defend themselves. The sounds of lightsabers and the screams of agony alerted the rest of the temple. Lord Athema walked forward as she knelt down next to one of the Atarun priests who had his knee cut open. She looked at him and watched as he pleaded for mercy. She placed her hand on his throat as his pleas for mercy turned into fear. Lord Athema ignited her lightsaber and dragged it down into the man's neck, just enough so that he could suffocate to death. Athema got up to see Yoda making headway through the Jedi. She grinned as she stepped forward and then removing her robes wearing a rather revealing outfit as she lunged into attack. Yoda looked to his left as his master cut down two Atarund that were moments away from striking at him. Yoda watched as Athema shot lightning out of her hands and flipped over the Atarund priest who ate the lightning with his face. Lord Athema cut through him as she landed upright and ignited a second lightsaber. She jabbed forward and swung around as she collided with an approaching lightsaber. Yoda jumped up as he tried to keep pace with his master, but when things slowed down for him, he looked over and watched it like it was slow motion. 
Lord Athema was surrounded by six Atarun priests, and she moved like a cyclone. Her movements were precise and defined, not missing a single beat. Every strike, every moment was brilliant as she cut down those around her. She kicked back and then rolled forward as the Atarun were at such a disadvantage, not a single one of them were warriors. None of them were ever Jedi. They were all peacekeepers, never subjected to being warriors, and it cost them all their lives. Darth Athema continued forward as she began to use the force to crush pieces of the building, dropping them down on the younger members of the Atar Rund. There was no remorse for them. The travesty is that the Atar Rund was definitely a better organization than the Jedi, and instead of the Jedi being wiped out, the Atar Rund would face extinction within several minutes of the Sith arriving. Lord Athema made sure Yoda understood that there were to be no survivors. There was no mercy on the dark side of the Force. The entire purpose of the trip to Andrillion was a max execution for the Utter Rund. The Sith were back and the Jedi wouldn't even know because no one cared about the Utter Rund. They were seen as traitors to the Jedi and forgotten to time, and now their order would be forgotten and left to shambles that no one would ever, ever discover. After 30 minutes, there was no one left alive. The entire Utter Run was wiped out. Yoda looked at his master as he asked her if there was anything else that they were going to do while they were here. She smiled and shook her head as she pulled her robe with the force and wrapped it around her body as she walked back into the ship they arrived in. Yoda understood and followed her. There wasn't a doubt in his mind that she knew what she was doing. They would be heading to Korriban to continue their training. Lord Athema knew what she had to do. She knew what she had to learn and she wanted to accomplish on the Sith ancient homeworld. As for Yoda, he wondered what his master would have in store for him. Yoda sat quietly in the cockpit of the shuttle. Lord Athema rested her eyes in the seat next to him, as he thought about what he had just done. Yoda looked at hyperspace coming towards him. Was the execution of the Atarund worth it? They were essentially defenseless. Yoda hadn't had a cruel master before. Strud and the two before him hadn't taught him the true nature of the dark side. Of course, Yoda and Athema were still figuring it out, especially the way that came before them when Bane was a true dark lord of the Sith. Yoda just couldn't understand. He got that the Jedi were the moral enemies of the Sith, and Yoda had no issue with using the dark side, harnessing it for its power, but the Utter Run weren't Jedi. They were a bunch of priests. They had no real impact against the Sith or what they were trying to accomplish. Yoda wasn't sure if he was overwhelmed or if it was just overanalyzing the situation. He couldn't deny the fact that it felt good to massacre those who were inferior to him, but something just felt pathetic, like there wasn't any competition to it. Yoda looked back to his master and almost fell out of his seat. Her yellow eyes were staring into his soul. Athema asked Yoda why he was questioning what they did on Andrillion. Yoda hesitated. He felt like it was a trap question, though on the contrary, it was out of curiosity. Yoda admitted that he felt that the Atta Rund weren't real adversaries. She smiled, snug in her evil robes as she looked at Yoda, telling him that it was the true intention of the Sith to show their power. Those around the galaxy would need to learn to respect the Sith and the power that they would hold so dear to them. Athema leaned back in her seat with an almost glum smile on her face as she told Yoda that it was her most important intention to ensure Yoda would be able to experience that. Yoda questioned her as she told him that she knew she would never see the day that the Sith took over the galaxy. That day would come during his life, and she was content knowing that. This almost immediately broke Yoda's heart. Yeah, 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 the way of the Sith, but his attachment to his master was very, very important to him, and he knew because of his species' lifespan that he would outlive her, but the fact that she was working so hard for a future that she would never see was not only sad, but it was inspiring in a way. Sure, it could be seen as a moment of weakness within a Sith Lord, but it could also show Yoda the importance of their way of life, and how it meant so much to them. Athema smiled as she told Yoda that there wasn't anything for him to worry about. The most important leg of his training would begin when they arrived on Korriban. From there, they would reinstate the most powerful regime of the Sith. Athema turned around and closed her eyes again, as she meditated for a moment on the small conversation she just had with her apprentice. She wanted to instill the path for Yoda to succeed into his mind. She wanted to ensure that he could enjoy the power that he deserved. And this gave her a certain level of pressure, the pressure to burn herself out and work to the bone so that her apprentice could enjoy a life she could only dream of. But in a way, she was perfectly fine with that because her lineage would extend through her student. Hours later, the shuttle would land on Korriban. The planet was dusty and currently dark, shrouded in the night. 
Athema and Yoda walked out to the front of the temple and took in the sight they saw. It was magnificent. A huge temple filled with information. It would be the perfect location for a training to continue. There was so much history on Korriban, and the dark side flowed through the planet itself. For Athema and Yoda, it would provide them perfect cover to begin working on their plan for the dark side to take over the galaxy. The two of them walked into the temple. Everything about the temple was different, and it was much larger than the one on Kreis too. It made sense why this was a home world of the Sith. The towering pillars filled the halls. Some of them were broken and fell apart, for, for the most part, the temple was in good shape. Athema suggested that they split up so that they could cover more ground again, and so they did. This temple on Korriban was so much larger, it couldn't even be compared to the one on Kreis too. This made the two Sith wonder if the temples on Malachor and Exegol were any larger than the one here on Korriban. Athema voyaged down into the depths of the temple, searching into the darkest places across this massive landscape. Athema was able to find the burial grounds. There were names she recognized, but many she'd never heard before. This was what she was searching for though. When she studied under Bane, it was under this place that she was going to start her next leg of her journey. In the tombs, she would find artifacts and be able to access the power of the dark side in a much more concrete way. From these tombs, she would be able to use these artifacts of the greatest Sith the galaxy had ever seen to harvest her own power from it, and then teach that to Yoda. Yoda, on the other hand, would take notice of the great interior, finding the throne room for the Sith Lord, and he also found a room for what seemed to be spells within an altar in the middle. Yoda was more or less excited to bring to his master the throne room. Just a little something she could enjoy since she wouldn't, in her words, live to see the downfall of the Jedi. Several hours later, they would reconvene in the middle of the temple by happenstance, to which they would both tell each other what they found. There was no library here. It seemed as if Korriban didn't have any Sith holocrons. Regardless, Athema informed Yoda that the next step of his training would begin. Yoda, on the other hand, showed his master the throne room, as he expressed how much he thought she should have it. Athema knelt down and placed her hand on Yoda's shoulder. She looked over and pointed at the throne. She told Yoda that while she was the Sith Lord and his master, that throne wouldn't be for her. That throne would be for the Sith Lord that defeated the Jedi. That would be Yoda's throne. And until then, she would teach him everything he needed to know so that the throne would become his. Yoda understood, and then for the next five decades, Yoda and Athema would become the most powerful Sith since Malgus or the Sith Triumvirate. Their journeys would take them from Korriban to Malachor and to Exegol. On Exegol, the two of them would discover the ancient Sith Eternal, a group of loyalists that believed in the way of the Sith, similar to the worshippers from Kratos II. The two Sith Lords had no interactions with the Jedi in the last 50 years, but they did come up with a plan they believed should work. Lord Athena was in her 70s, rapidly approaching her 80s. The dark side made her powerful as an older woman, and she was still strong, but noticeably weaker overall. She no longer had the energy of her younger days, and her apprentice was able to outdo her in every aspect other than the Force itself. It was a narrow margin, but just enough. Though there was no intention from Yoda to follow the traditional method of killing off his own master, taking on the role of Sith Lord for himself. By this point, the plan that Athema helped Yoda conjure up was in the works. While Athema spent most of her time on Kreis too, mostly tormenting the Sisters of Darkness for her own enjoyment, Yoda was out scouting out the galaxy, looking for the 12 Force users that would eventually fill the Order of 13. Yoda and Athema decided against just having two members, noting that the three masters before Athema had broken the rule of two. While technically Yoda wasn't an apprentice, it was technically of a technicality, and honestly no one really had time for that. So Athema and Yoda set up Yoda to begin his Order of Thirteen. He'd be searching for Force users, though the only issue is that they were often claimed by the Jedi weeks before Yoda could catch up to the scent. Their decision to leave the Rule of Two was just a theory. Yoda was growing into something so much more incredible than his own master. The intended journey was becoming complete, and at 300 years old, it would only be a matter of time before Yoda became the Great Sith Lord. Yoda was on the trail, and as soon as he found the first child, he carried on a hot streak, finding seven more children of the Force. Within a month and a half, all of these children would be brought back to Kreis II to be with their Grand Master. 
Athema would take care of the children until Yoda had all of his students. Athema didn't have much to do. She had small incubators to take care of them when she was out torturing the Sisters of Darkness for her own amusement, but for the most part she did take care of them. It would take the rest of the year for Yoda to find the other five children of the Force. None of them had any names, so he decided that he would have to name them with his master. There were four girls and eight boys. Their names would become Jer, Kern, Skor, Mirren, Pinta, Fildic, Zol, and Justith. And for the girls, Chax, Armour, Fear, and Kiad. Yoda was excited about the future of training these young minds, and he rejoiced in the thought of training his own students. When he returned with all of his students, he noticed something off about his master, though. She was acting a bit differently. Not in a cruel or rude way, she was just weak. She resorted to staying away and out of sight most of the time. She didn't want to be seen as weak, so she avoided her student. Yoda would try to communicate with her, but there was nothing from her side communicating back. It was more or less that she wanted Yoda to remember who she was when she first training him. He never saw this as an insult, though. She, by this point, had taught him everything he knew, and she herself was very impactful on his life. One day, Yoda felt a disturbance, and he made his way around the temple to find a secret room that she showed them when they returned the Kreis to originally. Yoda ran in as he found Athema on the ground. She was looking up at the ceiling, and she looked over to her apprentice. She looked so sad and disappointed, and so Yoda got to her as he asked what was wrong with her. Athema told Yoda that she never wanted him to see her like this. She was always meant to be a powerful man master until a peaceful death in her sleep, but this was embarrassing. Yoda got down next to her and held her hand as she told him that the legacy of the Sith now belonged to him. Yoda didn't want to let go, but it wasn't going to change. It was his moment to take control of the Sith and to become the Sith Lord. Athema told Yoda to carry on the dream and be everything that the Sith needed because the future belonged to him. A small smile faded across her face as she faded away and fell lightly back onto the ground. Yoda's eyes closed as he held her hands for a couple of minutes, taking in everything that had just happened. He knew he owed it to her to construct her a great tomb. She was the beginning of the new Sith, and she would be the motivation for Yoda to be the Sith Lord she believed he could become. Yoda used the Sisters of Darkness to construct a tomb for his master and prepare a ceremony to bound the body of his master to the tomb, encasing it with a Sith curse that would corrupt any individual who broke through the tomb or tried to mess with it. At the same time, Yoda would begin to theorize on how he would train his students. This training process would be very important to him. He had to make sure that these students grew up, believing in the ways of the Sith without any hesitation. They would follow the same exact lessons that Athema taught him throughout the years. Yoda, after the death of Athema, was the most powerful Sith in the galaxy, and his ceiling was still not reached. Yoda was around the same power as Athema, but he still had much higher a ceiling than she had. Athema, on the other hand, was so powerful because she was able to build up to her ceiling. Yoda still had much more to go. Yoda planned out everything he needed, but the truth is, he would feel extremely lonely for the next couple of years. Sure, he was able to interact with the Sisters of Darkness and the Sith Eternal, but there was no one like his master, and for the first couple years, the twelve children he brought back to Kreis too, he felt alone with as well. Sure, he had his students, but they were just children, they weren't really functioning individuals, and they couldn't be taught until they could actually comprehend anything. So Yoda locked himself away and planned lessons out, and when the time came, he rejoiced in the functionality of his students. But just because they were kids, it didn't mean they got an easy pass. Yoda would train the students harsher than Athema was ever with him. Yoda had no intention of dragging his feet. All he wanted to do was ensure that his students grew into the Sith apprentices he wanted. Their growth would start slow, but when the kids reached their preteens, they began to accelerate. All the students were relatively close with one another. They saw each other essentially like siblings. Even though none of them were related, they called each other brothers and sisters. This allowed them to have a more aggressive growth pattern. Their growth was inspired by their teacher's tough behavior. The students fell deep into the dark side, and when they reached their teenage years, they began to go off-world from Kreis II and travel to Exegol and Korriban. The students naturally fell into their roles as Lord Yoda's apprentices. It was only a matter of time, and how long it would take for them to continue to impress him. 
As they trained, they all adopted aggressive forms of lightsaber combat. Each of the twelve had their own respective styles that varied within the form of combat they understood. Though Yoda immediately noticed an issue. None of these students had a true ceiling within the Force. Yes, they would make decent apprentices, but for the time being, the biggest issue is that none of them could ever equate to his own a power, let alone the power of his master that came before him. Yoda still tried to teach these students to grow into their power sufficiently. This would prove to be effective as the 12 members turned into the age of their early 20s. While the 13 were out on a trip to a local mid-rim planet to scourge the population, it was great fun until 8 people rose from the rubble. The Sith were obviously not intimidated by this behavior, as they all twirled their lightsabers and stepped forward to kill them. Then all of a sudden, the eight people ignited their lightsabers. The weird thing is that they weren't dressed as Jedi, but they were dressed as regular citizens with lightsabers. What the Sith didn't know is that these Jedi were also known as the Lost 14. They were eight of 14 different Jedi Masters that had abandoned the Jedi Order. The Sith didn't know that, and they cockily jumped into battle against the former Jedi. The 12 students of Yoda moved in at an impressive speed. They were still so young, but they had the potential to take the fight right to these Jedi, as they assumed they were. The Sith engaged under the fire of the town they burnt to the ground. Their crimson blades clashed with blue and green as their confidence dissipated under the control and poise of eight Jedi Masters. Lord Yoda bounced around between through the Jedi Masters who cornered him. As for his students, they tried to hold their own, but Darth Jur and Kern, the closest of the bunch, stood side by side as a single Jedi Master whipped around them, grabbing one of their wrists and cutting through them without remorse as he pulled Jur's blade around and shoved it into Kern's chest. Chax and Binta stood side by side as they faced down another Jedi Master. Their action was successful as they pressed hard against the former Jedi, and then another one of them came around and caught them by surprise, as the two of them were cut down instantaneously by the two Jedi. Yoda watched four of his students die as he shot lightning into the throat of one of the three Jedi around him, as he leapt up onto another's shoulders and slit his throat. Yoda jumped down and cut into the woman whose throat was struck with lightning. Yoda turned around as he faced down the last Jedi Master in his corner, as Darth Josiath, Fildic, and Amro fell lifeless to the ground. Yoda's anger rose. He had 12 students when he came here, and now only 5 remained. Yoda leapt around and used the force to snap the back of the Jedi in front of him, before running forward and dragging his blade through the ground and through the body of the Jedi that laid there helpless. Yoda turned to see 5 Jedi and 5 of his apprentices facing off. Yoda could see that they were scared. They had each lost their brothers and sisters and they were terrified. Yoda leapt in front of them as he assured them that they would come out victorious. Yoda rallied his students as they felt confidence grow and their feelings of success tripled. Yoda leapt in front of them as Zol and Kiad followed their master. Fear and Skor and Mirren stayed close behind, pulling up the rear. Yoda was able to separate the three Jedi Masters from the main group, all three of them recognizing that Yoda was the leader. The other two took on the remaining five with extremely high confidences. The Jedi lunged into attack and the Sith apprentices fell back in almost complete terror. In the front was Zol and Kiad as they pushed back. Fuhrer moved up to help out her sister as Mirren joined his brother. Skor began to backpedal in fear, afraid of the Jedi and the power that they possessed. Yoda jumped in between the three Jedi, leaping up and down as he harnessed the true power of the dark side, shooting lightning out of the three Jedi and then lunging at them. Their fear was shown in their facial expressions. Behind him, Zola and Mirren were making a push on the Jedi Master as Fyrir and Kiad struggled a bit. They called out to Skor who ran forward seeing that his sisters were in need of assistance. Yoda cut down two of the three Jedi as Fyrir, Skor, and Kiad were able to kill their Jedi Master. Yoda turned back as he threw the blade forward and then using an ancient technique ignited the two blades of the fallen Jedi and lifted them up into the air using the force to manipulate the blades in the lightsaber combat. The Jedi dodged the thrown lightsaber as he ducked around and swung at the two blades floating before him. Yoda twisted around as he pushed both blades against the Jedi Master. He stumbled and then Yoda pulled his own blade out and cut through him. Behind him, two Sith were able to cut down the final Jedi. Yoda turned around and sheathed his blade as he looked at his students. Yoda was disappointed. They outnumbered the Jedi and yet they suffered just as many deaths. Yoda still not processing that those who they were fighting were not Jedi. They were not regular Jedi Knights either. 
They were experienced masters who abandoned the order, opening them up to the full range of the force, making them stronger than any average Jedi master. Yoda didn't say a word because before he could say anything, Lord Mirren stepped forward and yelled at his master. Yoda looked at him as if he lost his mind. Mirren accused Yoda of not defending them. Yoda shot back telling him that he was trained to defend himself with the power of the dark side. The failure of the other students wasn't a reflection of his own teachings, instead it was a reflection of their own inability to be the apprentices they should have been. It was a failure to be better. Then Zul stepped forward, taking the side of Mirren. Shortly after, Ferrir, Kiad, and Skor took the side of their fellow brothers and sisters, standing up to their Sith Lord, Master. Lord Yoda didn't take this too seriously as he tried to calm them down, and then from the debate came the sound of a lightsaber ignited from Zul, as he told Yoda that this would be him becoming replaced. Yoda didn't hesitate. This was a threat. His students failed him, and now their betrayal would be dealt with. The travesty of this is that the fact that Yoda wished he would have the same relationship with these students as he did with his master, and through all of it, it made him realize the truth about the Rule of Two. This was the exact reason the Rule of Two was created by Lord Bane. Its purpose was to serve the longevity of the Sith. Had the Sith kept the same relationships of Athema and Yoda, it would have been much different, but that was clearly not the case with these students. The other four ignited their lightsabers, and then they all rushed their master. Yoda stepped back as he took a deep breath. He leapt through the middle of them, cutting off Skor's legs as he cried out in pain. The other four of them turned. Yoda moved like a blur. He jumped up as he clung on to Kiad as she panicked. Yoda slit her throat and then jumped over and cut through Zul. Yoda shot lightning through Mirren and then threw his lightsaber at Firir. She was able to deflect it and then Yoda moved at her with the intense speed, splashing up and down as she dropped to the ground dead. Yoda turned to Skor, his last apprentice still alive. Score looked at his master and apologized. He felt so sorry for what he'd done, begging his master to be kind to him. Yoda shook his head with disappointment. He looked at Score and told him that there was no mercy. Yoda jabbed his blade through Score's face and turned around. The village was burnt to the ground, eight Jedi were killed, and twelve of his students were dead. Yoda felt great disappointment. He was meant to be the pathway to victory for the Sith. He was meant to accomplish the dream his master could never see. And yet all of his students failed him and failed her. And he didn't know if he could ever train another because of it. Maybe it was a drastic feeling, but he needed some time away from teaching. 20 years since his master died and 20 years since he began teaching a class of dead students, traitors to the ways of the Sith. Yoda knew that from here on out, he'd be sticking to the rule of two. It was just a matter of finding the right Sith Lord that would fit his new plan. Yoda would decide upon what to do to empower the Sith. As the years picked up, turning into decades and shortly thereafter turning into centuries, Yoda would have new apprentices and students, none of them being anywhere close to his power, all of them falling short of living a successful life and the very few of them that ever challenged him faced the same fate as the five students who died in the mid-rim. Yoda was approaching his 600s, still in fantastic shape, when he traveled deep into the Outer Rim. His student had recently tried to overthrow him, a 40-year-old Rodian Sith Lord by the name of Darth Atroon. His failure was easily predictable, and it didn't take much. Yoda didn't have to use many efforts to kill him, though Lord Atroon tried to kill him in his sleep. Yoda was much wiser than Athrun and never gave him a chance. Yoda's voyage into the Outer Rim led him to a planet of Nalhutta. He naturally avoided the Hut home world because the Huts quite frankly disgusted him. They were large slugs that had a nasty behavior of being overzealous and pompous. Sure, they were climb lords, but they came across like politicians, which was rather repugnant. Regardless, Yoda found his way in front of the Hut Council, and it led to a negotiation. Being that the High Republic had a tight grip on the Mid-Rim and the Outer Rim, it'd be challenging, but the Crime Lords had already been planning for the downfall of the Republic systems. The Crime Lords could sneak into the Outer Rim with more strength than the High Republic, and it would give up some of his own territory. One of the planets Yoda had in mind was Tatooine. At the moment, it was a shimmering example of pride in the High Republic. The glimmering cities of Mos Espa and Mos Eisley were known galaxy-wide for being the modern example of beauty, and it would be a great place for the Huts to interject themselves into Tatooine and watch the High Republic give Tatooine and some of the surrounding worlds up in the name of peace. The Jedi wouldn't do anything because they were under the whim of the Senate, 800 years without the Sith, and there was no reason for them to ever interject. 
The Hutts were certainly skeptical, but they would come to find that Yoda knew more than his small head would suggest. Maybe the Hutts should stop judging books by their covers. Yoda watched as the High Republic began to back off its territory in the Outer Rim. This didn't happen immediately, but it was a gradual process that would slowly cross over through two centuries. The High Republic would also fade out of power. The Jedi would slowly recede away from the Outer Rim. Yoda's plans would be amplified with a visit to Zygeria and bringing out the most brutal slavers the galaxy had ever seen. Yoda may have been small, but his impact on the crime lords exponentially impacted the galaxy that would inherit his soon-to-come plans. Though so after not having a student for almost 200 years, he would return to Kreis II and visit his master's room. He hadn't been in it before. He was just looking for answers, maybe something to give him an extra guidance on his mission to find a new apprentice. Yoda then found something that might be of interest. It was coordinates to a blue and green globe in the mid-rim. Yoda would take this piece of information and begin his scavenger hunt to the planet of Naboo. Yoda's trail would lead him to the public records of which he would find the last name of his master entrenched in the planet's history. Nowadays, it was a proud house with a couple of kids, and the youngest one of them having been born only eight years beforehand. This house had a strong political weight on Naboo. Yoda was wondering why she never mentioned this to him. Maybe she would have told him before she died, but she never got the chance because of the sudden death that she had. Yoda tracked the records to a great house, though there was something so dark about it. Lord Yoda walked in and looked around. There were dead people scattered throughout the entire house, and in the middle, Yoda looked at the ancient descendant of Lord Athema, the youngest member of the house, a boy named Sheev Palpatine. Yoda looked at a young boy with interest. The child stood with a knife in his hands, and his little pompous royal outfit was covered in blood. Yoda took a double take as he noticed all the dead people in the room. The child saw Yoda as a threat and gritted his teeth and ran at him with his knife up. Yoda didn't move. He just looked at the boy as the boy stopped in his tracks, frozen by the force. Young Palpatine yelled out and demanded to know what was happening to him. Yoda then spoke. He told Palpatine that he was very powerful with the Force. His lineage was also very powerful. Palpatine snarled. He hated his family, and assumed that they were all political brutes, with the belligerent attitudes and repugnant behavior. Yoda walked around the boy and said it wasn't a recent family as a family member. It was someone who was the original patriarch of the power that Palpatine now possessed. Yoda asked how it was possible that the Jedi missed him. Palpatine sneered back, saying that his father believed Palpatine would make a better politician on Naboo than a Jedi on Coruscant. Yoda asked why he resented his father then. Sheev admitted that his father beat him and treated him badly. Yoda nodded his head. He told Sheev that he had come to train him to become his new apprentice. Sheev looked at him. Yoda noted a couple things off the bat about Sheev. Firstly, he was incredibly powerful with the Force. Sheev also had the same look on his great, great, grand, and so on, grandmother. Sheev and Athema had the same look in their eyes. The same natural colored eyes, too. That's essentially what it was. The third thing Yoda noted is that while Sheev was portraying himself as a little vile being, acting like he could take on the whole galaxy himself, he was afraid. He didn't realize the power he had at his disposal. While, yes, he did hate his family and wanted nothing to do with them, he was afraid. After all, he killed his parents, and he had nowhere to go. He had no one to take him in. He would have to flee into the galaxy so he didn't get prosecuted for murdering his entire family. Yoda asked Palpatine that if he released him, would he have the conversation with him? Palpatine asked what he meant. Yoda raised his hand and told Sheev that he was holding him in place with the Force as he elegantly lifted Sheev off the ground. Sheev looked everywhere and then back to Yoda. Yoda smiled and placed Sheev back down gently. The little boy was eager to learn how to use these powers. But he told Yoda that if he let him go, he would plead his allegiance to him. Yoda looked at Sheev. Yoda then told Sheev that while his words were true, he knew that Sheev intended on killing him. Sheev's eyes shot open. Yoda could see right through the little menace that stood before him. Yoda expressed that while he could inhibit the powers of a true Sith, he would become nothing if he tried to vanquish his master. He would lose, and the Sith would carry on without him. No other Sith master would have been able to tame someone like Palpatine. He was actually a little menace. But considering Yoda was taught by Athema, he knew exactly how to interact with a Palpatine. Because the truth is that Sheev and Athema were incredibly similar. The dots connected perfectly. The more Sheev talked, the more it made sense. It was like he was naturally drawn to the dark side. It made Yoda question how the Jedi hadn't ever discovered this family before. Yoda released Sheev and told him to come along with him. And he would begin his training. He would be his father, the one that he never had. So they walked past the glimmering knife 
and out of the large house, into the hangar bay, and into the ship, where they would immediately depart for Kreis too. Yoda had taken all of his previous students to Korriban, so maybe he should take Sheev to Kreis too instead. After all, it was the first place he and Athema went to, so maybe it would be worth their time. Yoda turned in his seat as he set the ship into hyperspace. When he turned around, Sheev's eyes were glued to the viewport, watching hyperspace come at him. It was an incredible sight for a child. So, Yoda let him enjoy it for a moment, as he then asked Sheev to tell him about himself. There wasn't much Sheev had to say that he hadn't already said. He was a son of a political family that used to have a lot of influence on Naboo, before they were all killed. Sheev was curious about Yoda, and everything that Yoda had to offer. Yoda started telling Sheev that he was in his early 800s at this point. He had trained several Sith, many of which tried to kill him. Every single one of them failed. She was in awe. Yoda continued, he started talking about the downfall of the High Republic and how we contributed to that, and how his next target was the Jedi Order itself. Palpatine listened as Yoda expressed that if only the Sith had come before and done their job correctly, then maybe they would have already defeated the Jedi, and Sheev would have been able to live a life of luxury. But if Sheev worked as hard as his ancestor did, then together they could become the most powerful beings in the galaxy. The truth is that Yoda was already one of the most powerful beings in the galaxy, and Sheev had the potential to become the other, more like a Thema. His midichlorian count was just a bit higher than hers anyways, but the blood that flowed through Sheev was the same that passed through a Thema. When the two arrived at Kreis too, Yoda showed Sheev around the temple, where they would occupy. Palpatine was also to be introduced to the Sisters of Darkness. Yoda then showed Sheev what the true power was by slaughtering one of the sisters and watching them all crawl to their knees and submit themselves to him. Sheev smiled as he watched the sisters all bow to them. Yoda took Sheev inside of the temple and watched as it began to glow. Yoda continued talking to Sheev, telling him that there was a Sith name his ancestor would have wanted him to have. It was in her room before she passed. It was a vision that came to her, and the same information that led Yoda to Sheev was the same that was the name. Regardless, the name was Sidious, and if Sheev wanted it, he could have it. Sheev welcomed the name with pride, as Yoda took the newly crowned Darth Sidious to the tomb of his ancient, ancient grandmother. Yoda told stories about Athema as he showed Sheev what stood before him. Yoda then warned Sheev not to mess with it. There was a curse protecting Athema from intruders, and if he messed with the tomb, he would be consumed and cease to exist. Sheev looked at Yoda with shock, and then turned around and took in the view of the temple. Yoda placed Athema's tomb in the most remarkable spot inside of the entire temple. The lighting around her tomb was perfect and the view was even better. Regardless, Yoda took Sheev down to the middle of the temple and began his teachings. For 13 years, Yoda would train Sheev harder than any other student he'd ever had. Sheev appreciated it. The training was difficult, but he was more powerful, and he was powerful enough to keep up with Yoda. While Sheev killed his family in cold blood, he became reliant on his master, not in a bad way, but he genuinely appreciated his master and even respected him. Yoda became the father that Palpatine never had. Even more than that, Sheev and Yoda had a very similar bond to that of Athema and Yoda. Of course, for Yoda, this was what he'd been missing. Nearly 500 years since Athema died, and finally he had someone who was worth sharing his knowledge and power with. Yoda thought the wise enough not to give all of his knowledge to Palpatine. He knew that Palpatine would be a possible threat if he did that, and while Yoda could read through everything Palpatine thought, and none of his thoughts seemed to be treacherous, still, Yoda was on edge. Over the last 13 years, Yoda filled Sidious's mind with plans of how they would destroy the Jedi. Yoda had recently discovered a temple under the Jedi Temple that could be weaponized. His plan was to destroy the Jedi Order from below. Though, for Sheev, he was given a choice. He could join Yoda, or he could get himself involved in politics. To Yoda's surprise, Sheev chose to become a senator for Naboo. He'd have to work for it, of course, but Palpatine was already brilliant in the ways of politics. It was just a natural thing for him to be good at. Yoda trusted a student, and so the two of them split up. Palpatine went back to Naboo at the rightful age of 21, and kept in close contact with his master. At the same time, he wielded the two blades that once belonged to his great, great, and so on grandmother. They were beautiful lightsabers, the hilts were shiny and they hadn't been damaged, even in all the years since Athema died. Palpatine kept them because out of all of his relatives, he genuinely cared for Athema, and loved the stories of how she helped revive the way of the Sith and passed it down onto Yoda to carry on that legacy. While Palpatine was on Naboo, he would have an encounter with a Jedi named Hego Damast II. He was a taller man from the planet Mygido. His species was a Mun. Palpatine didn't like the man, but he was able to avoid him and continue working on his scheme. 
Palpatine intended on jumping through the political ranks. The plan for Palpatine to be the death of the Republic, while Yoda was going to be the death of the Jedi. The responsibility felt equally on the two of them. Yoda was able to sneak down below the Jedi Temple and get into the Sith Temple below. But there was a tragic issue. Because the Jedi knew the temple was there, they immobilized it. The entire structure was a weapon, and while the Jedi didn't destroy it, they made sure that it couldn't be used if the Sith ever discovered it. So, Yoda now had the difficult decision. He had to figure out a new scheme, to take the fight to the Jedi, because it was currently up to Palpatine to rework the Republic into absolute failure. Yoda decided that he needed time to think. So much failure in one life surely hurt. Without telling Palpatine, Yoda went to Exegol to figure out what he would do. It wasn't a big breach of trust considering Palpatine was running campaigns on Naboo and couldn't be on Coruscant unless he won the election, which he wasn't looking too favorable to win. A 21-year-old kid with no political long-time evidence of actual winning, and a long-time senator of Naboo. Not to mention a 21-year-old who hadn't been seen since his entire family was murdered 13 years beforehand. Regardless, Yoda found himself on Exegol, surrounded by the Sith Eternal, searching for answers in a massive structure. There had been something he had to do. There was also an incredible thing to note. Without Sidious, or Yoda, playing around with the Force, doing things they shouldn't be doing, there was no creation of the Chosen One. Yoda walked through the temple several days without sleeping, just muttering to himself, speaking under his breath. He looked at statues next to him, he looked at the Sith Eternal who surrounded him, and then his mind clicked. He came up with the solution as he called upon the Sith Eternal and rallied them in front of him. He had one request for them. He was sending them all out across the galaxy to do his simple bidding, and then they would go to Korriban. Yoda's plan would mimic the success of the past with a touch of the present. Yoda wouldn't get trapped in the failures of the past, this time he would make sure the Sith learned from their greatest failure. As the Sith Eternal found various ways off of Exegol, Lord Yoda found himself going to Kreis too, to give a similar message to the Sisters of Darkness, and they would just go straight to Korriban instead of going out to the galaxy to do the other part of the mission. Yoda was moving with purpose and everything was selected to make sense in his mind as he went out to the Outer Rim to find the Crime Lords and speak to each of them on different levels. He needed certain equipment from them, not now, but it would be required in the future, a lot of it too. They thought Yoda was a bit insane, but all the Crime Lords did owe Yoda. It was negotiated that if they successfully took over the Outer Rim, which they did, then Yoda could have whatever he asked for in the future. They didn't expect him to ask for it though, but Yoda needed to be the one that requested. It couldn't come from a student. The Crime Lords all assumed their role would outlive Yoda, but it turned out Yoda finally realized what he wanted from them, and it would be excruciatingly expensive. But they had time to come up with the funds to get it done. Yoda continued on his hot streak as he departed from the Crime Lords and got to Naboo to find out Palpatine had lost his election. Palpatine was very morally defeated. He had to wait another six years to become a senator, meaning he couldn't run for senate until he was 27. Yoda informed Palpatine that it would be perfectly fine. They would take their time. Yoda admitted that he had his own failures, but then it led him to something else and what their new plan would become. Sidious understood, but he was interested in the logistics of how it would work. Yoda told Sidious that it would work better than it did in the past, and once they took the power they deserved, then it would be absolutely unstoppable. On the other hand, they needed to come up with reasons for the Jedi to be seen as failures by the Senate. Palpatine understood. He would work rigorously to understand the failures of the Jedi most of the information being given to him by Yoda, who helped make the Jedi look like the frauds they were. Yoda would also take some time to visit Dathomir. Their current patriarch was Old Daka, the wisest of the witches. Yoda wanted to establish a tighter bond with the Night Sisters. He'd been to Dathomir multiple times over the last several years, and he and Old Daka were friendly for the most part. Yoda came for students of the Force. All of them had been failures. The Zabraks were often too aggressive for their own good, and not loyal enough to Yoda, so they were all killed. It worked out in Yoda's favor though, because he didn't have to worry about non-loyal Traglodytes. On the other hand, Yoda informed Old Daka that he wanted to have two more students from her village at some point. Old Daka told Yoda that none of the Night Sisters would be permitted to join him, though one of their children, maybe. Old Daka told Yoda about Talzin, who was very well liked as a Night Sister, and she was next in line to become mother of the Night Sisters. Maybe Talzin would be of assistance, but Old Daka reminded Yoda that the Night Sisters didn't get themselves involved with the politics of the Jedi and Sith relations. It's why they survived and Sith struggled to even remain existent. Yoda certainly understood her position. He didn't like it, 
which is why for the most part, Yoda and Daka weren't exactly friends. They just got along, but their viewpoints pushed them away from one another. They couldn't come to a common ground. For Yoda having two students from Dathomir, this might work in his favor, but he also never knew with old Daka. Daka told him that she would reach out to the forest when she felt there was a chance for him to have some students. Yoda and Palpatine would reside on Naboo for the next six years, staying in the shadows while the Sith Eternal began their work on Yoda's plan. It was successfully at work. It was in progress, too. The question of the matter was how efficient it would be. Yoda and Palpatine sparred every night on Naboo. They were incredible duelists. The Crimson Blades was like lightning, but Yoda had to at least admit that Palpatine was by far the best student he'd ever had. It wasn't even close. Palpatine was so much like a Thema, and it oppressed him even more and more as Palpatine shot for his ceiling. Yoda knew it was a matter of time before Sidious surpassed him, but he wasn't all that concerned about it. Yoda could still read through Palpatine's mind, and there was no treacherous thoughts. Something Yoda ensured is that when he first started his connection with Palpatine, he could see through all of his thoughts. It's what prevented the Rodian bastard of Thrun from killing Yoda in his sleep. Sidious gained his confidence on the battlefield and in the political arena. He defaced opponents in primaries and local elections. Palpatine genuinely hated them. The local arena was pathetic. He strived for the arena the senator races demanded, and when he finally got the chance to get into that arena, he thrived. Because of his election victories, he secured his own victory in the senate race within a month. And then from there, he won the most lopsided election in Naboo senate history. For a 27-year-old, that wasn't too terrible. When Palpatine won the election, he was able to live on Coruscant, which meant that the first leg of their plan was in effect. This took Yoda back to Korriban, where he would start his leg of the first plan, finally taking a hold of what the Sith Eternal had been working on. Yoda's inspiration on Exegol took him back to the days of the Old Republic. The inspiration was to build a Sith army, both full of Sith warriors and Sith troopers. It didn't really matter. The Sith Eternal stole children from all across the galaxy and brought them back to Korriban. On the other hand, the Sisters of Darkness were raising these children. When Yoda arrived on Korriban, there were close to 300,000 children. Many of them had grown up just a little bit, six years old at the most. But the Sith Eternal had accomplished this over the past six years. Yoda would have wanted more, but it was a start. Of course, the Sith Eternal were still doing it, but they still had to be more careful. They stole children from the Outer Rim and Mid Rim, for the most part, sometimes from the core. Yoda brought in a local pirate named, named Dante Onaka. He had a son with him, and his son's name was Hondo. Yoda used the pirates to begin teaching the children how to use firearms. Yoda's indoctrination would torment the young minds of Korriban. On the other hand, there were actually several force users, not thousands, but a couple hundred of them, that were found. When the term force user is used, it doesn't mean someone as powerful as Yoda or Sidious, but someone with more of a basic understanding of the force, or just even the midichlorians to use a force. When Sidious got a chance, he would travel back to Korriban to take a look at what his master had constructed. At the same time, Palpatine was using the Force to manipulate the brain-dead senators of the Republic. This actually worked really well, considering there were plenty of politicians within the Republic that didn't really know how to operate their brains. So Palpatine began to plant thoughts in their minds, reasons to see the Jedi as their enemies rather than their saviors. The Senate was years away from depicting the Jedi as failures, but it was all about the small steps. It's not something Yoda ever overlooked, but it was what many of his former students overlooked. When one is on the road to success, the smallest details matter the most. Yet only Athema, Yoda, and Palpatine understood that. Many of the others that came before or after didn't have the appreciation for what these small steps could do for their plan. All the former Sith Yoda killed accomplished this tragic misstep. Now after Yoda's failure with the Order of Thirteen, it's weird to consider why he would choose to start an army. Yoda realized that because of how close the Order of Thirteen were, the Twelve Apprentices believed they could overthrow their leader. On the other hand, an army of Sith would all be fighting for more power, sure, but they would see Yoda and Palpatine as almost godlike individuals, just in the same respect of how the Sisters of Darkness and the Sith Eternal saw them. Yoda thought this to be an effect idea, so he went with it. So far it was working, but the kids were just kids. With thousands of troopers, those with the ability to use the Force would be able to enjoy a little bit of power, but they would also realize that they had a ceiling. From what Yoda understood, having a larger number would keep everyone in line, because do what others are doing, because it's popular mentality. For the next 14 years, it would increasingly grow. The Sith army would grow into 3 million, except it wouldn't be on Korriban. Most of it would be spread out. The most loyal members would have commanding positions, and the new Sith Empire would spread out to Malachor, the Kreis II, Exegol, and Korriban. 
the Jedi would continue to be exposed. Yoda's Sith would be at the number just over 4,000 members. Force users were hard to come by. Sometimes they got lucky, but this told Yoda that these Sith would have to be trained as well. And it became the only thing he did. He could only train these students. An increasingly difficult task, but he was able to accomplish it. Sometimes Palpatine would be fortunate to get involved, but overall he was manipulating the Republic. On top of that, Palpatine and Yoda had set Trade Federation up to be the potential danger for the Republic, laying the groundwork for a mobilized Sith uprising. The Jedi felt it, but they were helpless to do anything against it. They were under consistent public ridicule because of the dialogue carried out in the Senate. It was because of Palpatine, but he himself didn't hold himself responsible. Young Palpatine came off as a moderate, so for many within the Senate, they saw him as such. They didn't think of him anything more than just a moderate, who was able to make both sides of the lines happy. Because he was just manipulating, he was using the Force to manipulate others to believe things, and he wasn't actually saying those things. Through his manipulation and the Force, he created a lot of tension within the Senate. Sidious didn't anticipate his actions to work so well, but the truth is, is they worked to perfection. The Senators got in heated exchanges over the Jedi, and it began to take up most of their time. Their discussions would be overwhelmingly filled with whether or not the Jedi should be within the Republic or not in the Republic. The Jedi, of course, were more concerned with the Senate than the growing darkness in the galaxy, not to mention their inability to figure out why millions of children had gone missing. By the end of the week, Palpatine had convinced the Senate to remove the Jedi from the Republic and therefore ousting the Jedi from Coruscant. The temple would remain, and they could go there, but the majority of the Order had to relocate. This actually went for the better, much more better than Palpatine or Yoda could have ever anticipated. On top of that, Palpatine was running for Chancellor of the Republic, and he was extremely popular. Yoda would be informed by his apprentice that the Jedi were leaving Coruscant in mass exodus. This was perfect. Even better was the Jedi were leaving in groupings of thousands, so 1,000 members and a council member would depart for one of four planets to begin building up the Order again somewhere else. These massive groups would leave four at a time. It was easier, especially with 9,000 members the Jedi Order currently had. The last thousand members inside of the temple would carry out the rest of the Jedi Council members, uh, but currently these groups were going to four different planets to decide which would be the best for the Jedi to restart on. Even better was that Yoda had the locations. With his millions of troops and thousands of Sith, his plan was going to come to fruition. Yoda would dispatch groupings to mimic the numbers, but double them. With hundreds of thousands of Sith troopers and thousands of Sith being dispatched, the Jedi were in for a surprise. Everything was peaceful to begin with. Unloading their vessels, children playing, knights and padawans doing the heavy loading, individual council members and masters scouting out the location and how they would build up a possible new temple here. It was all good until, from the trees, rocks, seas, and stands, death would rain down upon them. Blaster fire would erupt, and lightsabers would ignite. The ambush was far too much for anyone. Jedi would be massacred, and nothing would please Yoda more as he watched in silence. The panic in the Jedi as the Masters tried to save their Padawans, and the fear in the faces of the younglings as they tried to flee, hide, or escape. All of the choices useless. The best part was, Yoda got to watch it twice. His troops were able to hide all the bodies, and then, when the same atrocities were acted out, on the new members that came. The Jedi Council wasn't informed. The last thousand Jedi wouldn't find out until they reached their location, and they too wouldn't stand a chance. Of course Yoda could go down in glory and fight in the battle, and end the war with himself, but why would he? He was the emperor of the most powerful army the galaxy had maybe ever seen. Maybe that was just a little ego boost for him, but it didn't really matter. They won. The Jedi were dead. But that wasn't the end of it. Sidious was a chancellor, and now he could throw the Republic for a loop. They had no army, no nothing. And while they never found out about the execution of the Jedi, after they banned the Jedi from the Republic, they sealed their own fate. Not that the Order of 9,000 Jedi could ever be able to stand up to millions of Sith troopers, but they would have had a chance to try and do something like the old days of the Old Republic. But that would not be the case. Yoda made sure to tie off all the loose ends. With the Jedi wiped out, Yoda would return to Korriban, so that he could have the throne his master promised him so many years ago. Yoda claimed his seat at the throne of the Sith Temple, and the Sith armies were dispatched across the galaxy. Within a year, half of the Republic would crumble. Palpatine thought about taking out his old master, but he decided against it. Firstly, out of respect for his master, but secondly, he didn't want anyone to get the idea, or any ideas. It would be around the same time that old Daka would inform Yoda about two Zabraks that had recently been born. These two would become Palpatine's first students, Maul and Savage. Yoda and Palpatine would continue their studies of the Force for the next several decades. 
Palpatine's interest in the Force itself would lead him to try and manipulate the Force in unique and exotic ways. This wouldn't also create another life form, it was just manipulating the Force. Yoda advised against it because of the possibility of creating a chosen one, an individual that could break everything they built. But as Yoda aged, he made sure his apprentice learned everything he could. The truth is, Palpatine was also getting older. Palpatine would surely outlive Athema in years, but before Palpatine passed away of natural death, Yoda would depart first. It would be a tragic day, but it would be after Yoda was able to accomplish the dream his master wanted him to have. Palpatine would carry on for merely 10 more years as Sith Lord until that role would be passed down to Savage and Maul, who as brothers would take the helm of the Sith and the most powerful Sith army the galaxy had ever seen. The dark side was unstoppable. The question was for the future, was if the Sith would obey the respect between Yoda and Palpatine, or if the Sith would object to their own destruction and a galaxy united under the control of the Sith. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the conclusion to our three-part mini-series. Again, special thanks to Benjamin Wells, Jonathan, Pimp Daddy Bane, Icy Raptor, Apollo Mad Madman Studios, Anakin 003, and Gort for supporting the channel. Hit the other likes on this video so we can see whatever comes next. If you want to see what else below, I read all the comments about no crossovers, check out the Twitch, community, Discord, and Patreon to support me in other ways. And if you want to free lightsaber, go down below. I have a dock. You go on the dock, click on the dock, you write your name on the dock. Giving away three lightsabers, so when we hit the fifth, when we hit 50,000 subscribers, I'll be giving away. And uh, check out these other channels. I've got a bunch of new channels under my brand name, so go check them out. Got a ton of new content coming out. All the content will come out on Saturday or Sunday this weekend, so stay tuned. And the importance of waiting for a series to end is what we're going to talk about. So I've got the comments all across these videos. Now I'll be honest, I don't really care about hate comments. They don't bother me. They kind of just go through me. That's the whole point of hate comments. Just keep it in the comment section. I don't really care. Um, but there are a lot of people talking about the story. When it's a part 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 of series, uh, they're gonna there's gonna be a conclusion. Um, now when I first wrote part one. I didn't think Athema was going to be connected to Palpatine. That wasn't intentional, um, but by the time I finished part one and started going into part two, I was like, actually, this would be really cool. Really cool for it to build up that way. I originally wanted Athema and Palpatine to, uh, Athema and Yoda to have a really nice bond, and that'd be something that inspired him to have with other students, um, but he didn't have that until he had Palpatine, and Yo Palpatine was always meant to be Athema's. Uh, great 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 and so on grandson uh, and the importance of athema palpatine in the story is really kind of the archetype for the story it's really the 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 build for the story now i don't like to make characters and insert them as a main character athema is not a main character she is um she is essentially a side character um she is the supporting cast essentially uh, and that's what I wanted her to be. I didn't want her to be anything more than that. I usually do that with characters that I made myself, is that I don't really want to put them in the spotlight. And that's uh, not an insult to myself, but it's my respect for the story at, at, at hand. I did it with Daisha, I did it with Natabra, I did it with Zena. They're all characteristics of a story, and they can all exist within the story. And that's where I wanted to go with this. Um, these characters, Athema, Strud, Athrun, these characters can all exist within Star Wars. These characters can all exist within the rule of two. That's the point of these characters, and the something that I wanted to bring to the story is that these characters could exactly exist. They could exist. They could exist in Star Wars, just like Daisha, just like Natabre. They could exist inside the Jedi Order and be killed by Order 66, just like Zena. She could always be a smuggler on Tatooine. That's just her life. Um, but that's the point. These characters are supposed to fit into the story without disrupting the actual cause of the story. You know, Athema being related to Palpatine doesn't take away from him, it might add to him. In some opinion, it might take away from him. It's kind of how people view Ahsoka, and that's kind of a thema in my eyes. She adds to the character of Palpatine, that is Sheev, uh, because she is the original Sith, who kind of goes out of the way, has a kid, and then kind of forgets the family, and he's born 600 years later. So it's, it's kind of a trickle-down thing where he just kind of shows up after a long time, and I thought that'd be kind of fun. I thought that'd be kind of an interesting way, because Star Wars, as George Lucas himself said, it's a family soap opera. Star Wars is just a family soap opera. That is literally how he describes one through six. It's a family soap opera. So I figured, why not do that? Um, you know, it's not like, um, like Athema isn't uh, a Mary Sue, and that's not what I wanted her to be. Athema is Athema. She really is. Uh, that's, that's all she is. It's a powerful Sith. She comes in a line of non-powerful Sith. That's just all it is. It's nothing to do with anything else, so get that out of your mind, please, and thank you. Uh, that has no place in my comment section. Anyways, Yoda's legacy and the failure, but success. So Yoda's legacy is always tarnished by failure, and that's always how we see Yoda, is failure. 
Uh, and that's because of what he's done with the Jedi. And I wanted to keep that same thematic detail with this, except Yoda doesn't just give up. Uh, Yoda kind of gives up in, in the story. He kind of gives up and just goes to Dagobah and calls it quits. Here, he doesn't give up. Yoda is dedicated. He wants that dream that his master gives him. Athema gives him a, a vision, an idea, something that he can achieve, something to give, to look forward to. Gives him that vision, and he wants it. He wants it because it was shown to him. It was told to him, and he wants it. And so he's going to strive for that. And no matter how fall, how close he calls, comes to his shortcomings, he's able to get there. And I think that's the original bond for Athema and, and, and Yoda, because that's that's really that's the main center point for the story honestly and uh, I know I, I mentioned that I wanted her to be a side character and that's what I truly believe she is it's that relationship almost like a, a mother-son relationship that they have even though they're around the same age technically uh, she kind of takes the helm as his master and kind of has a mother-son relationship with him which he carries on with Palpatine as a father-son relationship and as George would say, it's like poetry, it just rhymes. And that was really what I was trying to go for. So, I hope you all enjoyed this story. I really put my heart into these stories, and I always want you guys to enjoy them. And I hope you all enjoy the characters that I, I introduced, because uh, I would never make a character that would take away from the story of Star Wars. That's just not that's not fun, no one likes that. Um, and I always want my, my characters to feel relatable in some way, to be inspiring in other ways, and to be someone that you can draw and like just like you know someone that you could just be like oh my gosh that's cool i like that you know i like that a thema exists i like that a throne exists i like how strut exists you know the legacy of the failure of the sith the chance for the sith to return saying that there can be sith there the the role of two exists for like a mill millennia almost like a thousand years or so who's saying that a sith didn't have aspirations for something more, but just fall short of it. Or who says that the Sith didn't lose their way and someone had to show them their way, someone had to be the the architect for, for what would come in the future. And that that's that's kind of what I did. So I hope you all enjoyed. I love you all, spread the love, and always remember, may the force be with you.